wrestling fans. If you're going to the NCAA tournament next week in Detroit, stop by our happy hour. It's taking place on Thursday in between session one and two at Hockey Town Cafe. It's a sports bar near Little Caesars Arena, walking distance, I'm told, to Little Caesars Arena. We're co-hosting it with Stalemates, the very popular YouTube show. We're going to have an open tab. We'll be giving away merch. Stop by and see us next Thursday at the Wrestling Changed My Life Happy Hour, co-hosted with Stalemates. And without further ado, let's get to the interview with Coach Roger Reina. I mean, I think at the core of it, you know, it's belief. Um, and that really deep-seated belief. Um, you know, not the superficial, like, yes, I'm going to get it done. But like, deep in your core, you know, when no one's watching, when you're by yourself, making that decision um, deep in your heart um, that this is your time. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. It's Friday, March 11th. We're just a few days away from the NCAA championships and in honor of the Nationals taking place next week. We're releasing a third episode this week. This one is with Coach Roger Reyna, the head coach at Penn. Coach Reyna and I first met last summer when he was featured in the audio documentary Slang Satiev that went live in August. And this episode's all about Coach Reyna's journey to Penn and some of the work he's doing now. Penn is having a resurgence. They're having an incredible year. They put nine at the NCAA tournament. And Coach Reyna... Just an awesome guy. One of my favorite people in wrestling. I hope you enjoy this interview. Fan of the week time. It goes to Jake Calmer. He recently left a Apple podcast review. Five-star review, I might add. And Jake said, just stumbled on this podcast. Lifelong wrestling fan. And these deep dives into the making of all these champions are great. Thank you so much for the review, Jake. And anyone who's listening, if you'd be so kind as to leave us a review, give us a rating. It goes a long way to making this podcast bubble up to wrestling fans just like you. And before we get to the interview with Coach Reyna, a quick thank you to our sponsor, Spartan Combat. They've been with us for a long time. Give these folks a look. Go to SpartanCombat.com. Tell them we sent you. Now, without further ado, let's get to the goods with Coach Roger Reyna. Coach Roger Reyna, welcome back to the podcast, sir. Thank you, Ryan. Much appreciated. Good to see you. Indeed. I'm so excited for the season you guys are having. Nine qualifiers, which is the most in Penn history. Give us your thoughts on the, on the conference tournament and how you guys ended up. Yeah, you know, we, we went in with confidence. And at the same time, um, there was a little question mark in the back of my mind, Ryan, because our, our guys honestly just did not have a lot of postseason experience. Um, last year, you know, the Ivy League presidents decided not to have winter sports and um, so the bulk of our guys um, took a leave of absence from school uh, amidst the pandemic. And um, fortunately, we were a very young program. Um, so we were able to do that. We didn't have like 50 year guys uh, necessarily getting caught in that. Um, and then the year before, um, obviously, there was no NCAA tournament. So we had two years with no NCAA tournament um, and a year without the EIWA. So we had, we had kind of that. Just a little question mark in the back of our minds. How are these guys going to handle the postseason? Um, we went in uh, with all 10 guys seated 
in the top eight, um, coming off of, uh, you know, I think a really strong and really consistent um, dual meet season, regular season. And, um, and our guys really stepped up. Um, uh, one of our team goals was to place all, all 10 guys in the top eight. We ended up placing all 10 guys in the top six. Um, and then as the season progressed, we're like, top six, let's get all these guys to the NCAA tournament. And, um, and we were feeling it. And, I, I, you know, either they were too young, we forgot to tell them they were so young and didn't have the <laughs> postseason experience, or it just didn't matter at all because um, they really wrestled well. And uh, so we had nine automatic qualifiers. And um, our one guy uh, who didn't qualify, he placed fifth at the conference tournament and is the first alternate, Neil Antrazian at 184. So, um, so that's how we landed at the EIWAs um, individually. Yep. And what was the most you had had under your, <clears throat> under your uh, stats before this? Like, I know you've been there so long. That's crazy. Me, this is the most ever. Yeah, yeah. So we had several years where we had eight uh, qualifiers. Um, we had one year, Brandon Slay's uh, junior year. Um, we had eight finalists in the EIWA tournament and a third. Um, but that year, the, uh, the guy that took third, our, our qualifiers back then, were very limited in the EIWA. It's grown quite a bit since then. Um, so our third place guy didn't go. And, and um, wow. so eight, eight was the previous record. I've never had any, any team where all 10 guys placed in the top six. So that's a first. So we have record setting, record setting EIWA performance for our team. At least once a week, I'll be walking around my, my condo here and I'll think of the quote that that news newspaper guy said otherworldly i don't know why that just i cannot get that out of my head and you know i'm talking about the 97 eiwas that were at the palestra and uh you know we spent a lot of time on that those 90s eras during the slay documentary but uh just knowing now you guys got this whole momentum going and i, I feel like i can feel it from here just the uh all season things were just building for you guys and and uh, are the championships going to be in penn next year the EIWA championships, yeah, they're coming back to the Palestra. We're really excited to host uh, 2023 EIWAs and then the NCAAs coming to Philadelphia in, in 2025. Uh, so Penn and Drexel will co-host those 2025 EIWAs at the Wells Fargo Center uh, in Philly. Nice. Well, you know, as you look at this season and the momentum that's been building for you guys all year, I look at your staff and I just blown away by, by some of the names you have there, you know, BJ Futrell, obviously an Illinois guy, a legend growing up. If you saw BJ walk into a tournament with the red Harvey twister jacket, you know, you were in trouble. So he was, yeah, he was just amazing. And Mark Hall. And um, I didn't know a ton about your, your assistant Pearsall, uh, but I did you know, realize he was on a lot of those Penn state teams. So just talk about the staff and uh, how it's come together. Yeah, yeah, I'll start with Brian Pearsall. Uh, he's our associate head coach, uh, one of only six coaches at the University of Pennsylvania across all sports that's ever held that title. Um, so he was promoted back uh, just a little over a year ago, year ago, February, um, to the associate head coach role. He's done a phenomenal job. Um, he was my first hire when I came back and took the program over um, just a little over four years ago. And um, you're right. He wrestled for Kale up at Penn State. He was on three uh, NCAA championship teams at Penn State, their first three. So really a pioneer there. Wow. Um, and then Brian went on to, to coach a year at Rutgers, uh, Scarlet Knight Wrestling Club. Um, and then three years at West Point um, with Kevin Ward. Um, and those guys were doing a really strong job up there and, and recruiting well and developing well. Um, when I came down to take over the program at Penn, he was the first call I made. Um, but I'll share a little, you know, inside story. We met in a really kind of an unusual way. Um, my daughter uh, was an elite uh, ECNL you know, soccer player. And her coach walks over after one of the games and says, you got to meet my husband. And I'm like, well, who's that? And he, she said, Brian Pearsall. So this was more a Pearsall who played soccer at Penn State. And she was coaching <laughs> my daughter's club. <laughs> so wow. that's how Brian and I met. Um, and we, you know, we kept in touch for a couple of years. And then, you know, when I, uh, when I took the program back over here at Penn, I, I think three weeks later, I hired Brian. Um, and we've been working together since then. Um, he's been a phenomenal organizer, recruiter, um, technician in the room, you know, bringing, you know, the kind of Penn State system down and um, uh, just really, really a, a great team player in, in every way. 
That, no, he's uh, his. That's an incredible resume. And Kevin Ward is is amazing. So knowing he was up there, he's got kind of this John Smith blend, this Kale Sanderson blend, and you know making it all work uh, at Penn. So wow. And, and what about uh, what about BJ? How how did he come into your into your world? Yeah. So BJ came down as a, a senior level athlete with the PRTC initially, working with Coach Slay. And uh, BJ had been at, at the Michigan Wrestling Club up with Sean Bormet and, and that group, Cliff Keen. Um, and then we recruited him down here to the PRTC. Uh, and BJ made a U.S. national team. He was top three, um, you know, and uh, a really unique stat amongst all the PRTC senior athletes. Every one of them, Ryan, has hit a personal best while they were training here at the PRTC, including wow. BJ. So he made his first U.S. national team here. Um, he was the PRTC's first ever U.S. national team member and ranked in the world. Um, and unfortunately, uh, he tore his ACL in that 2020 U.S. Open. Um, and that was the end of his career. He got operated then um, and went down and uh, took a job at Navy. He was down there with Joel Sherritt for one year at Navy. But then he came back up and he was working for Beat the Streets here in Philly working with, uh, you know, those, you know, that organization doing all the great work they do with those inner city kids. And he was the director of mentoring there. Um, and then, you know, I had a, a assistant coach position open up when Chase Pamby went back to his hometown, Las Vegas and, um, and BJ put in for the position. So, you know, we talk about this wrestling ecosystem in Philly between, you know, Penn and Drexel um, partnering on the PRTC uh, being one leg of the stool, the stool. <laughs> Um, you know, we've got, you know, beat the streets Philly, and then we've got, um, uh, you know, the college programs, right? So, you know, BJ has, you know, and now he's an assistant coach here at Penn. So he's had a hand in each of those um, different entities here in the Philadelphia wrestling ecosystem and um, phenomenal technician, um, you know, accomplished, decorated high school level, college level, um, Olympic level, um, but also just a really uh, deep keel as a human being, you know, he's, he's just really grounded, um, you know, a great uh, relationship builder with the guys on the team and, and still a phenomenal technician in the room. Yeah. And he's, his attitude is just fun to be around too. Like you're, you're in a good mood around him, you know, and uh, yeah, just, uh, just amazing that he's out there with you guys. And, and you mentioned the PRTC, we'll come back to, to coach hall PRTC though. I mean, man, Joey McKenna is just, He's getting better every tournament. He was recently on the podcast. Obviously, you have the GOAT, Jordan Burroughs, out there. Um, what's it been like having some of those guys around with Coach Soleil? Just fantastic. You know, like, um, you know, and, and having Olympic-level wrestlers in and around the Penn program um, is not new to us. I mean, it goes back to the Foxcatcher days. And, again, the, the Soleil, Saitiev, um, you know, video and documentary that you did, I think, was just wonderful. Um, but it reflected back to those Foxcatcher days when, you know, Dave Schultz and Brian Dolph and Danny Shade and Trevor Lewis and all those guys were in and, in, in and around our program. And then, you know, that morphed into the Dave Schultz Wrestling Club. Um, and so for three Olympiads, you know, we ran that. Um, and again, a number of Olympic level guys in and around our program. Um, in Sydney, when Brandon Slay made the team, he, he was one of three uh, Dave Schultz wrestling club guys that, that made the Olympic team for the U S going down to Sydney. So, um, it was Kerry Colat, uh, Brandon Slay and freestyle and then Heath Sims and Greco. Um, so we had Schultz, little Schultz club had three, uh, Olympians in Sydney. Um, so when we formulated the PRTC, which was back in 2014, you know, it was built on that, you know, that experience really decades of experience. Um, and so, you know, Richard Perry was, was one of our first recruits, Danny Mitchiff out of Ohio. Um, and then in came, you know, BJ Futrell and Dan Valamont and Chase Pammy. And again, across the board, every single one of those, you know, hit personal bests, you know. Um, Richard twice to the finals of the uh, U.S. Open. His only domestic loss over years was to David Taylor. Um, Richard was ranked in the world, placing high, meddling at, at Uregan and big tournaments around the world. And obviously, you know, he had a, a horrible, um, you know, traumatic accident at the world team training camp, you know, out at Camp Pendleton. Um, that year, Jordan Burroughs had actually selected Richard uh, to be his training partner, you know, to go to the world championships. Um, 
and going back a little further, Ryan, uh, you know, Kyle Snyder picked Richard, you know, to be his training partner to go down to the Rio Olympic Games. Wow. Uh, so that's the the respect that you know Richard's you know USA teammates and peers had, and Richard was a U.S. Uh, national team member in freestyle as well. Um, he still trains with us you know, every day. He's still part of our family, and and you know every bit a uh, uh, senior athlete along with the other guys. Um, but this new wave um, of Joey McKenna, uh, Dave McFadden, uh, two-time U23 freestyle champion, um, who just beat his first world champion um, over in the Yastardagu in, in nice. Turkey. Um, you know, and Jordan and Mark Hall. Um, I mean, we've got a terrific group of guys, and they're hungry. Uh, Coach Slade doing a, a fantastic job with them, you know, and very well integrated, you know, with our collegiate programs here at Penn and Drexel. Yeah, they are. It's it's just like a a whole new level of guys. I mean, these are Mark Hall phenom. I mean, an absolute phenom at every level he's ever wrestled. One guy I will admit, I don't know a lot about him though, other than his stats and being a fan of his. What's what's he brought into the program in addition to some of the guys we've already talked about? Are you talking about Mark Hall? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, you know, Mark is, uh, yeah, he's an incredible, um, incredible athlete competitor. He's an incredible technician, um, a really phenomenal teammate, very thoughtful teammate, you know, in the room, out of the room. Um, and, you know, a year ago, you know, last, or I guess it was really last summer. It wasn't even a year ago yet. You know, he put his hand up and approached us and our volunteer assistant position was open uh, and he told me he was interested. And I said, well, that's absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, competing at the Olympic level and being um, a volunteer assistant, you know, here is something that, you know, um, going back to Brian Dolph being an assistant coach and, and you know, making the finals, of the Olympic trials and competing successfully internationally again. You know, we know how that works. And I talked to Mark a lot about just how to balance your energy in doing that. Um, as a coach, you have to be very giving and you, you know, you're concerned about you know, quite a number of people on the team. Um, and yet as an athlete, you really got to focus on yourself. And, and of course the PRTC, you know, your core senior level teammates. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the big conversation we had about managing your energy and balancing your time and communicating, or, you know, when it was a time period when he needed to pull back from the college team and, um, and focus on himself or, you know, when he had more energy to, you know, put more into the college team. And I've been just astonished, you know, Ryan, because uh, he hasn't pulled back on either. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's, he's delivering in spades um, in both areas. Um, he won the U S open, um, you know, back in the spring, his first ever U S open and he won the U S open. Um, you know, he's adjusting to the new weight class moving up. Um, lifting, getting stronger, getting bigger. Um, and he's just done uh, an incredible job adding um, a lot of value, you know, not just technically, certainly that, but just in terms of, you know, chemistry and morale and, you know, lifting our college guys up um, and having fun. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're having a lot of fun with us. And, um, and Mark Hall's right in the center, of all of that. I mean, look at him going back, wrestling at the Matt Men Open, the, you know, the, you know, the Midlands replacement tournament. And uh, yeah, I, but he's passionate about coaching. I saw him on Twitter getting fired up about some seeds. So I'm like, this guy's all in on it. I love it. Yeah, he's so, all in. Yeah, go ahead. No, yeah, no, he is. And uh, yeah, this just, you know, for a lot of people who don't know, you were the pen coach from 86 to 05 and went to some different positions in business. And if we have time to him, I'd love to get to those. But, you know, when you took over, you were 24 and Penn was basically ready to drop the program. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. You know, so I'm a University of Pennsylvania alum. I came here um, in, in my sophomore year, our athletic director brought us in and they, you know, told us that they were considering discontinuing the program. Um, we were all devastated, shocked and um, and it didn't, that, you know, that news didn't stay in house. It, it leaked out. And so, you know, anybody that wanted to wrestle in college, you know, had heard that Penn's program was in jeopardy. And um, our, my coach at the time, Larry Lockley, who was an NCAA champion at Pitt and an Olympian himself. Um, and our alumni really stepped up and, you know, Ryan, you know, the program here goes back to the very first college wrestling tournament ever held on Penn's campus in 1905 in a building here right next door, Waitman Hall Gym. Um, our alumni, when they got this word, they really galvanized and pulled together. 
you know, started, you know, raising money, lobbying the athletic director, just, you know, celebrating the, the inherent values that we know of a wrestling, in the wrestling community, but needed to be communicated to the athletic administration at the time. And, you know, fortunately, a, an athletic director by the name of Paul Rubenkam came in. Um, and Paul was a Penn student athlete himself as an undergrad at the time when uh, Penn's teams were very strong, Ivy Championship wrestling teams undefeated in dual meets for like three span of three seasons. Paul knew how strong, you know, the, you know, the tradition was and, and the hotbed of wrestling here, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and, you know, youth and club and high school. Um, and Paul uh, was the one that gave me a shot, you know, at 24 years old. Um, I was ambitious and, uh, and young enough, luckily not to have any fear. I probably should have had a lot of fear. I'm sure I didn't know what I was doing, but Paul gave me a shot. And he said, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to build this thing up and, um, you know, and that was, yeah, 1986. So, wow. And, uh, I just love hearing stories when a, a school threatens to drop a program and you really see how like united wrestling fans are and, and the alum of Penn came together in the eighties. And, um, uh, just knowing how big it is now, I can't even imagine, you know, the support that came out. Who was the guy who used to write you letters that you said, uh, uh what was that guy's name? That was Dr. W Austin Bishop. And um, I'm glad you remember that. He's, uh, I'm, I'm still very fond every time I think of him. He um, is an incredible, incredible person. Uh, but yeah, he wrote me probably a three page letter, you know, a week or two after I was hired, you know, indicating that he had held that seat in his day in the 1930s and 1940s. And Austin was uh, uh, in his 80s when I first met him. Um, and he had been the head coach here at Penn and, and, uh, took over a team that had been in the doldrums and, and moved them into the top 10 in the nation. Um, they actually finished eighth at the national tournament, and then World War II broke, and he left to go into service. Um, and he started the program at Wyoming Seminary, you know, now one of, if not the top high school program in the country. And John, uh, he was known as the Johnny Appleseed of wrestling in Pennsylvania. He started programs. He was a pioneer he convinced athletic directors who didn't understand the sport why they should add it and the values that would be developed in the young people. And he was also an Olympic level official. Wow. So he officiated in the games in Los Angeles. And then he was the head official of the Olympic games in Berlin in 1936. And anyway, he became a good friend and we rallied his teammates or his team members um, had reunions and, and we started raising money in the, Austin Bishop Endowment. That was our first endowment for wrestling here at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but just really inspiring, you know, just really quickly, one of the things he wrote was how he had built the team up in such short order. Um, and I felt kind of intimidated as a young coach reading that. What he had accomplished was phenomenal um, in a very short period of time. And, and I wrote back, you know, I thought very politely, well, you know, the Ivy League, you know, we don't give out athletic scholarships and the admission standards are very high. And you know, wrestling isn't, you know, consider, you know, we were rebuilding the program from scratch and, and, um, and I sent the letter off back to him. This was before email, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and then about you know, two weeks later, another letter came in, um, again, beautiful penmanship, you know, three or four pages long. I still have these letters. Uh, and it said, ah, oh, that's interesting. I appreciate your, you know, your, your challenges now. And we had a lot of challenges back then. And, you know, he went about explaining how he solved the challenges of his time and then asked a very pointed question. He said, how do you propose that you'll solve your challenges, coach? <laughs> What'd you I say? Thought, I thought, OK, it's time to meet this gentleman. And so we arranged a, a meeting in person and I drove out to his retirement home and we built a friendship that that lasted quite a number of years. And uh, I learned a tremendous amount from him. Uh, he's a brilliant coach. Um, wrote books, published books on wrestling, um, Olympic level official, uh, longtime supporter of the sport. And I think his books are uh, out in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame out in Stillwater, Oklahoma. He's one of the legends of the sport. So I was very fortunate to, to be mentored by him as a young coach. Man, every, every person I've had on this podcast that's had success in life, they've always had a mentor, like either directly or indirectly. And this was one for you, you know, maybe not every week kind of thing, but definitely someone who influenced your career. Um, yeah. Wow. And then when you look at all the people who have come from the Penn program, you know, the history of it's tremendous. 
did I remember that was Ben Franklin somehow involved in wrestling? And if I'm misremembering that, just tell me, I'm just, I have neurons firing here from our, from our interview a couple, couple of months, several months back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You're right. So Ben Franklin um, was someone who introduced uh, the idea of phys physical education and sports as part of education. Um, and it's something that today in our country, we take for granted, you know, all of our high schools, our colleges, you know, sports is, is ingrained um, in the programming and, and part of the educational institution, but that's not the case in countries around the world. Right. You know, we're very early on in most countries, you know, uh, kids have to make a decision. You're going to be an athlete or you're going to be a student, you know, which direction do you go? Do you go? Mm -hmm. Well, Franklin wrote in, in 1740s, the uh, proposals on the education of youth. And, you know, amidst all the pioneering things that, you know, he and the founding fathers um, drove forward, you know, one was a new way to educate and to integrate um, physical education and athletics into, uh, into academics. And so he wrote, you know, amongst other things in this proposals on the education of youth in Pennsylvania, that they be frequently exercised in running, swimming, and wrestling. Let's go. And, wow. uh, and had a you know, had a diagram, architectural plans with the wrestling facility in, in his original architecture plans for, for the university here. Um, so, um, yeah, so <laughs> our sport goes back a long time here at Penn. That's what we're talking about here, people. Penn wrestling is just, is the, so much history baked in and now back at the, uh, at the front of the, uh, of the headlines, at least for me, you know, I, I love following the program. We're a few days out from nationals. It's going to be an awesome week. You've been to a number of these. Brandon Slate took you to the finals twice. Brett Motter got it done. What have you seen over, you know, 30, 40 years of coaching? You know, the, the kids who go in and really get excited for this and perform versus the kids who maybe get a little too tight. What do you think it is? Well, you know, I think it's a lot of things. Um, you know, it's not just one. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, one on the one hand, experience helps. Having been there before. But I think, you know, that was one of my questions with our team here going into the EIWAs. We didn't have very much postseason experience at all, but they really stepped up. I mean, I think at the core of it, you know, it's belief um, and that really deep seated belief, um, you know, not the superficial like, yes, I'm going to get it done. But like deep in your core, you know, when no one's watching, when you're by yourself making that decision um, deep in your heart. Um, that this is your time. And, um, and so, you know, preparing for that, um, you can prepare, you know, technically, you can prepare physically, um, you can prepare tactically, I mean, you need to, we need to do all those things, you know, to give our guys the best chance, but then there's an element that um, we can instill in them, but really needs to come from the athlete uh, to have that deep seated belief. So, you know, we think, you know, like just sharing stories from the community, um, you know, Jordan in the room here, you know, talking with guys, Brandon Slay, talking with guys, Joey McKenna, talking with guys, Mark Hall, Brian Pearsall, you know, and really just sharing their experiences um, because they were all first timers at the NCAAs at one point. Right. And um, and building that culture of expectation, um, you know, that we're going to go out here and get it done. Um one of the things I talked about the other day was just, you know, avoiding the being the guy that's big eyed when you go through the tunnel and you walk out into that arena and see 20,000 people and hear 20,000 people um, not being the big eyed, you know, guy that's walking onto the floor and looking around in the stands or looking for mom and dad, or, you know, but being the one who's really just focused on the job at hand, good warm up, timing it well you know, mentally focused, intense, but not too much mm -hmm. uh, going about wrestling your positions in your match. Um, easy to say, <laughs> right. harder, to, harder to do, right? Yeah. And if you think about the guys who were like, we talked about earlier, but just around your program, imagine a kid talking to JB before his first nationals and, and Jordan Burrow saying, yeah, I was there. Yeah. I, I was there too. I was, you know, a night out from my first nationals. You know, I'm, I was thinking ahead today to Wednesday night, what everyone's going to be thinking and feeling. And yeah, it's, it's cool to hear that. Obviously they were there too at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Going to be exciting. Um, I just wanted to hit on two of your current guys here that jumped out to me. Your 133 pounder 
he's wrestling with a lot of confidence right now. Um, got the ninth seed, I believe. That's right. How were, tell, tell us about this young man, a Blair wrestler. Is it Calico? Michael, yes, pronounced Kolioko. Um, you know, Michael's, uh, he's not a newcomer to, you know, to high level competition. Um, so he wrestled in the Blair program, you know, a hundred and some wins, only six losses on one of, if not the toughest high school schedule in the country. Um, one of a very small handful of uh, four time Beast of the East champions. Um, you know, Michael, um, he won the junior nationals in Fargo and freestyle, freestyle, uh, tech falling his way through the field, um, as a high school wrestler took third at the junior world team trials. Um, he's been in the hunt to make world teams. Um, and as a, a freshman, um, he went down to 125 for us really as a team thing. And it was a really tough cut for him his freshman year. Um, but you know, he performed, uh, well, for the most part, you know, really well at the Midlands his freshman year. He took third, you know, big win over Drew Hildebrandt for third. Um, you know, he went high and highly seated at the EIWA tournament, got caught um, in his first round match um, and pinned with, with a big lead. Um, came back, won his next match and then uh, got caught in another uh, big move, six, six point move plus riding time and wasn't able to battle back. So he got knocked out of the Eastern tournament, didn't place. But on the body of his work, you know, was a was a, a wild card selection, um, and that's the tournament that didn't happen, right? The twenty twenty NCAA's. So still on the body of his work, Michael was recognized as a, a second team All American selection that year, um, and uh, and then he rolled into the fall under you know COVID and when the Ivy League wasn't having a season, and he went to the U twenty three Nationals, Ryan and got to the finals, beating a guy by the name of Austin DeSanto in the wow. semi. Um, so, you know, like. This uh, sounds Michael, like Slay losing to Catravone and then going to the U20, whatever, U20, whatever, it's Esquire. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. 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 Sounds just like that. He's, uh, Michael consistently puts himself in, in uh, the top of the heap. Um, he only has two losses this year. They happened on the same day out at Midlands. Um, we knew he wasn't feeling well that day. We knew he was a little bit off. Um, we found out he had COVID um, mm. when we got back. And so he was trying to compete, didn't know it at the time. And when we got back, everybody got tested upon return. Um, he turned up positive. Um, those are his only two losses on the year. Wow. Um, so other than that, he's undefeated. And um, he's a really exciting, high pace uh, kind of wrestler. And, you know, it's the kind of style we like. Very offensive, keeps his foot on the gas. Um, good in all positions, and um, and you know we really like uh, Michael's opportunity here this this upcoming week. Yeah, you can tell when guys just wrestle with confidence where they actually think they're going to win, and he's one of those kids. You know, he comes from a great program and just has like the just the swagger about him that you really feel good about his chances. Yeah. And you know, we're talking about the NCAs a little bit. You see different headlines um, about the seeding process. What's, what's your thoughts on it? Is it good? Does it need fixed? Oh, boy. Um, you know, I think that there's been a real strong push to make it numerical, to make it, you know, formulaic. Um, you know, and I think there's some value in that. But there's just so much nuance um, in our sport. Um, and, and, and I hate to see... You know, the coaches and, and the administrators in today's age um, rely entirely upon a formula. Um, you know, and the same thing with us at the EIWA. You know, Michael was actually the second seed at the EIWA. You know, we thought that was kind of crazy. He ended up winning the tournament, you know, pretty handily, you know, in all of his matches. And, um, you know, so, you know, we, we just felt like, hey, there should be, should be some discussion about this. Um, so I think there has to be a human element involved. I don't think we can rely on, on a formula entirely. Um, and I hate to see us as, as professionals and, and experts in the sport to abdicate our responsibility to seed uh, a tournament properly to a formula. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I think this formula is in its infancy. Um, it, it's, you, know, you can't go back and I don't know anybody that's gone back over 50 years and applied that formula and with a huge data set to be able to say, you know, this is ac accurate or here's the, you know, here's the holes in it that need to be corrected. Um, and I just think we're, I think we're relying too much on, on a formula that's not proven over time. Yeah. So I think, I think there has to be a human element to this. 
so when they're seeding the nationals, is there no human element? Is it wait, we put the data in and the data spits out and that's it? Yeah. So they, you know, there's a formula and, you know, it's complicated. I'm not sure I even fully understand it, but if there are um, athletes that are within a few points of each other, it can go to a tiebreaker, which is a separate, you know, formula that it's, uh, that people are put through. But my understanding is that there is not discussion. There's not a human element um, and judgment. And, you know, look, I mean, you know, you, you go to Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, um, there's certain decisions that, you know, that should be entirely data driven. And there's a lot that, that shouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, the human brain can, can computate an incredible, you know, vast amount of data in us in an instant, you know, and that's how we make these gut decisions. Right. Um, and I just think that uh, we should not be abdicating our, our responsibility as, as professionals and experts in the sport um, to a formula. So I, I hope there's some changes and some shifts Certainly, you could take this formula and apply it back. You know, if there's a mathematician who wanted to spend the time to do that over the past 20, 30, 40 years, how accurate it would be, you know, where are the errors in it? I think that's, that's mm -hmm. a place that we ought to go. If we want to be data driven, we got to provide a bigger data set to prove whether this thing really is working or not. But I, I, think, there's, I, I think there's holes in it. Especially when there's people who could easily do it. I mean, any of like the reporters who follow college wrestling deeply and I'm not one of them, but there are people who know like these guys who are 20 through 30 who they've all wrestled. And you know, so there's people who could do a really good job and would do it for free, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I guess I didn't realize that the coaches rankings, those were being done by obviously the coaches, but that, that they had such a big impact on it as well, because you just know yeah. that most coaches, I just don't know if every coach knows what other teams are doing to that level. I don't know. Yep. Yep. You know, I, I, you know, we're involved with a couple of weight classes on the rankings, on the coaches rankings. It's a tremendous amount of work to do it properly. Yeah. Um, and especially when you get into the, you know, 25 through 33 range, you know, to get that accurate in some way it's, you know, 20, 22, 23 through through 33, it's it takes a tremendous amount of work and time to get that accurate. And that's where it's even more important in some ways, because that's where the automatic qualifiers come from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we look at 184, you know, our, that's our one guy that, you know, that hasn't qualified. He's a first alternate, you know, he's, he's got quality wins, Neil Antrasian, he's a senior, um, and there were only three spots that were automatically qualified into the, uh, into the EIWAs. And there were three guys who were right on the bubble of qualifying spots. And he was one of them and two other guys. You know, so here you got a 17-team conference with three spots. You know, and then we look over to the Big Ten, and all 14 out of 14 Big Ten guys at 184 qualified. Um, one of them's got a 3-10 and 10 record. You know, no offense, but right. I, mean, I, I just look at it, and I'm just like – man, um, it doesn't feel right, you know? And I mean, I, I think we're always searching for the, the best formula, Ryan, you know, we're all fighting for the kids, you mm -hmm. know, to have the best experience and, um, you know, but I think there's some more work that needs to be done. I, I think it's moving in the right direction, honestly. Um, but I think there's more work that needs to be done. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, that's a weight class that drew a lot of attention. So what happened was a couple of guys went, uh, Oh, and two at the big tens, and which, you know, happens, you see that, but you know, the, the guy with the, the one and something record breast bu uh, busted the bracket a little bit and then he got in. So it's like, oh man, it's, it's a messy situation. And that was uh, that's actually the tweet I was thinking of Mark Hall. Yep. Uh, he was very fire fired up and uh, as he should be. Um, and so what happened there? So you, your guy was on the bubble and I'm sure there was guys from other conferences that had, you know, pretty good credentials. Yep. Neil came up as the first alternate um you Got know 14 it. out of 14 guys out of the big 10 you know are, are all qualified um you know and so um yeah i mean it's just uh, again i think it, it you know it needs some work and you know that you know the number of four i mean everybody's talking about the number of medical forfeits at the big 10 um you know what brian do you, what do you think about that I mean, if there's someone that's hurt, you know, that's, that's what a medical forfeit's for. If it's protecting your seed, if it's, you know, Hey, I'm going to arrest him, he's in. Um, and then it busts up the bracket or it busts up the qualifiers from other conferences. You know, that's wrong. That's flat out wrong. 
Um, you know, our associate head coach, Brian Pearsall, put out a tweet, you know, in terms of our performance at DIWS. We wrestled 42 matches, uh, no medical forfeits. Wow. Every, everybody wrestled every match, you know. And, and so, you know, obviously we had some, you know, some guys that were, you know, trying to gain um, automatic qualifiers or get to the RPI. And they were doing the one second medical forfeit the regular season. We got to clean that up. Clearly, it looks like the NCAA, you know, has eyes on that now too. Um, you know, but the number of medical forfeits at the Big Ten, if they're hurt, fine. That's what it's for. Yeah. You know, if they're not, and we're gaming the system. Then we got to look in the mirror and decide whether we're going to do the right things. You know, what we're teaching our kids. You know, guys on our team and what we're telling our community. You know, if we're just trying to game the system, uh, that's not right. And you know, a program like that you're running is highest integrity. So it's a disadvantage for programs that are doing the right things. If, cause they're not going to be participating in those practices, like the match fixing or fixing or um, the medical forfeit is, yeah, maybe there's like one or two guys at tournament, but I heard um, head coach Storniolo from Northwestern on yesterday, you know, there's situations where we're talking at the cliff Keen tournament in Vegas, a guy beats someone on the front side and then forfeits to him on the backside. Cause he wants to hold that win over him all year. That's yeah. disgusting. That is yeah. insane. And I didn't know that was, you know, again, I don't follow every tournament that closely, but wow, that is crazy. So, but then there are real situations, you know, where guys are hurt. So I don't know. It's a tough thing, tough thing to get to the bottom of. I'll tell you what Austin Bishop would say about it. Tell me. He'd say, whatever decisions you make, you know, that's the reflection of, of the character that you're teaching, you know, the guys on your team. And as educators, coaches, educators, this is our primary responsibility. Absolutely. There it is. Cut and dry right there. And uh, it's just, I hope, I hope it gets cleaned up. And because it's weird, like freestyle is trending so positively right now. It's yeah. so awesome. And uh, folk style is, it seems like it's getting its own way a little bit. We'll save the rule conversation for another time. I've been asking everyone about college rules. But I've been dying to ask you since the moment I first met you was you went into the business world and, uh, you know, I'm in the business world. I love that kind of stuff. Tell me what what you what you did in the business world, like any principles you learned or anything that you did while you were coaching and then you took to the business world and it really worked well there. I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Yeah. Compare those. Yeah. Two. So when I was away from, uh, you know, from coaching at Penn 2005 to um, to when I picked back up. Um, I did a number of different things. Initially, I worked for Penn Medicine Development. I worked as a major gift fundraiser and, and uh, worked with just some fascinating um, areas of medicine. So um, I worked with our transplant, our chief of transplant surgery, our chief of cardiac surgery, our chief of pulmonary medicine, and you know, raising money for you know, research and patient care and education initiatives. Um, and uh, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. It was a, an incredible education in those areas. Um, and so I spent three years doing that after coaching. And then I went into the uh, early stage technology uh, world. And, um, and I worked for a number of, uh, you know, very early stage tech companies that were in and around uh, sports and fitness. Um, one was an online ticketing company based here in Philadelphia, founded by a couple of Penn alums called Ticket Leap. Um, and I met them through, you know, venture capital investor um, who worked with Penn, um, you know, Penn startups. Um, so that was a, a terrific experience. I ran business development um, for our sports unit. We had four different units. And, you know, I learned about technology. I learned about, um, you know, managing growth. Um, you know, we had very, uh, you know, very high, um, you know, growth rate goals um, for a startup and, um, and just implementing technology. So, you know, business development was really interesting. It was taken... Um, in either a new technology into a market or taking an existing technology into a different vertical market. Um, and that's what I did. So, you know, I was first in taking that, you know, that product, which was a software as a service mm -hmm. ticketing platform um, into the sports arenas. Um, and we did a lot of stuff in high school state championship sports and, you know, all different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, women's pro soccer we ran and, and a number of different areas. So it was kind of like, you know, it was very pioneering. And I guess, you know, thinking back to, you know, building a wrestling program or, or restarting a program, you know, just kind of having that pioneering spirit and kind of pioneering attitude. Um, but I learned a lot about technology. Um, and so, you know, from there, I, I worked with a out of uh, sports, uh, a company called Life Shield. 
Um, Mike Hagan, who's you know one of the top CEOs in, in the region here, um, huge success at Nutrisystems previously. Uh, Mike brought me on to run uh, you know dealers and partnership um, you know relations for Life Shield, and um, that was a you know kind of a smart home automation, home security product. So I was completely out of industry, you know, for the mm -hmm. first time, and it was just like drinking water from a fire hose. But um, but again, partnership development. Um, and uh, dealer development, distribution of our product in, into new markets. Um, and again, kind of very pioneering, um, you know, kind of mindset. And so, you know, to me, those, you know, those startups that I worked with, um, you know, had that kind of feeling of uh, a team in a locker room, mm -hmm. you know, ready to go out into arena and, and do something that hadn't ever been done before. Uh, and I just loved it. You know, it was, it was fascinating. And then, um, the third I, I worked for, I worked with uh, Bill Stensrud, a company called Interactive Fitness, um, and we were developing a line of uh, you know, commercial cardio equipment um, that was really kind of extra gaming. You know, so now you think of Peloton, yeah. you know, we, we were the first in in that space, in that industry, um, where we were taking exercise and putting it on global, you know, platforms to compete, um, you know, in different ways. And, and, um, and again, I took that product into education market colleges and high schools um, where it really hadn't uh, it was kind of in its infancy um, and then I did some consulting you know so here it was kind of like back to coaching yeah so I, I did consulting with a number of different startups um, and that was really fun because you could you know you could kind of pick your clients um, mm -hmm. and go in and, and um, so I did a lot of strategic planning for startups um, you know as well as kind of like again business development and moving products into into new markets or taking a new product to market. Um, so that was my experience in, in the startups. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was really hard work, um, you know, no guarantees of success. And again, it just uh, it reminded me a lot of sports and, and the pioneers that, you know, that were in it you know, very inspiring, you know, really, really smart, really hardworking people. Yeah. It's a, uh, you realize then that wrestling may not be the hardest thing you've done. Yeah, to my man Dan Gable, love you, but man, I don't. You get around some of these people in business, and they're going hard. Like they are so intense, so driven, so smart. I'm always just like blown away by how smart some of these people are. Um, but I was gonna ask you, did you have the same excitement going to work every day, coaching that you did there? Um, wait, I'm sorry. Can you say that question again? Make sure. Sorry. I yeah, yeah. Did you have like the same excitement going into work every day for the startup as you did when you were coaching? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was different. Um, it was the same kind of energy, but maybe it was like I was very early in my coaching career where I was still learning, you know, the key variables that that had to be checked off to be successful. And and my experience looking back on it was there are more variables in, in the business entities, particularly in startups. Um, you know, it wasn't two or three or four or five things that needed to go right. It was like 12 or 15 things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was, uh, it was challenging in that way, but, um, but yeah, you know, I still had that same drive. I still had that same wrestler's drive, um, you know, and, and, and really putting the shouldering into the effort, um, you know, believe in, uh, sometimes, uh, I, I talked with our, our CEO and owner of, uh, uh, interactive fitness, Bill Stendrud, and you know, it was like, sometimes Roger, we just got to scratch it out of granite with your fingernails. And I was like, Bill, okay. I I know what that's, I know what that means, man. Yes. Uh, he was inspiring, um, really a luminary in the Silicon Valley and I'm super appreciative of him giving me the opportunity with that company, Interactive Fitness. Um, and then I came back into the athletic administration at Penn and, and um, you know, Dr. Grace Calhoun was our athletic director at the time. She was forming her senior leadership team and, um, and she brought me in as uh, a senior associate athletic director for external affairs. So long title, but basically I had all of our uh, marketing, our communications, our, our ticket office, you know, which dovetailed back to my experience at Ticket Leap. Mm -hmm. um, I ran all of our um, events um, and facility rentals, uh, including the Penn Relays, massive event. Um, you know, more athletes compete in the Penn Relays over three days then compete in the entire summer Olympic games. What? It's an incredible, it's an incredible largest track and field event in the world. Wow. Um, and so worked with um, Max Siegel at USA track and field. So I kind of understood the NGB role as, you know, working with USA wrestling. So mm -hmm. for so many years 
um, working with spot, ran all of our sponsorships um, for Penn Athletics. And it was a fascinating, you know, fascinating position. Um, I was in that position for two years. And at the same time I was doing that, um, co-founded the, the PRTC at that time. So it was 2014, 2015, you know, so I had my hand in coaching, you know, while I was an administrator here at Penn. Um, and then when the head coaching position opened up and I got asked to consider, you know, coming back to take it over, it was, uh, it was kind of like, wait a minute, you know, like, uh, you know, twice in a lifetime opportunity. I couldn't believe that first time I got a shot and, and, um, and I talked with a number of our alumni. I said, look, you know, if I'm going to consider coming back and doing this, like I, I need to know, you know, you guys are all in and, uh, and we're going to work together to make something really special happen here. And, and Ryan, hundred, they were hundred percent, you know, like coach, if you're in, we're in, wow. you know, let, let's go do this. So. And having guys like that in your corner, like I'm thinking of Clint Motter where, man, anytime I talk to Clint, I just got to be on my P's and Q's. That's the most buttoned up. Just he's so on it. So professional no, no loose words are said. He's just, he's the man. It's like, he's in your corner, like all these guys. Um, I just want to sign off with this. So were you even considering coming back? And like, when they first asked you, were you pretty much thinking yes, or did it take some convincing? Yeah, no, I, I had no intentions of coming back to coach, um, you know, collegiately. I, I was happy to, you know, help get the PRTC started. And, uh, and, I, you know, I coached Richard Perry. I cornered him out at the Olympic trials, um, at Carver Hawkeye and, you know, the Rio, Rio games. And, you know, he had that big match with Kyle Dake there, had the lead up until the final 45 seconds or so. And, um, you know, certainly it was, it was, you know, fun and exciting, but I had no intentions of, of coming back to coach collegiately. You know, when I stepped down, you know, it was really to be able to have more time with my kids. Um, David, you know, was nine and Lindsay was seven at the time. And, um, you know, it was about, you know, being with them through their middle school and, and high school years. And when I came back into the athletic administration here, you know, David was in college. My daughter, Lindsay, was about to go to college. So it was a much different time for my family. Um, but I didn't have any intentions of, of coaching at all. Um, but when it opened up and I got asked to consider it, um, different, different point in, in time for my family. And, you know, I really thought, wow, you know, like, uh, um, this could be really exciting if, if our alums are behind it, if our administration's behind it, um, and they've all been 100% supportive. So it's been a big community wow. effort. I was going to ask you how much better the work-life balance was when you were in business versus coaching. <laughs> Is it even comparable? The, oh, man, I, I tell you, I, I remember the first weekend I had off when I was in business. And I had, it was a September weekend. It was a you know, Saturday, I had something to do. Sunday, I went up to New Hope, Pennsylvania. I had breakfast with a friend and I was sitting by the Delaware River reading a book two days off on the weekend. And I thought, I was thinking back around, I was like, when was the last time I had two days off on a weekend um, <laughs> during the, I could, during a school year? And I was like, you know, it must have been like the sixth grade or something. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so the startups were, were heavy, were a heavy lift, but, you know, the, the work life balance, you know, was better. I mean, it's a grind, you know, college coaching is an absolute full grind. Oh my God. Um, have, have young kids when you're doing it. It's just incredibly challenging family wise. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate now, you know, my daughter's, you know, coming out to the NCAA championships. She's finishing up college. She's all fired up to come out to awesome. Detroit. And um, so um, yeah, again, I just, it, this has been a big community effort between our alumni and Penn athletic administration and, and all the wrestling and business people here in Philly and, you know, the beat the streets guys, Clint Motter and Brett Motter who founded that. And it's just been really fun to shoulder up with all these guys again. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, what a great way to sign off and it's awesome to watch. And uh, it was fun to, to cover it. You know, when we were doing the Satya Slay Satya documentary, that was so fun uh, really learning about Penn and everything. And yeah, I can't wait to see you guys next week. I'll uh, if I see you, I'll be sure to say what's up coach. And thanks again for making time. Please do, Ryan. Great to see you. Thank All you. Right. Wrestling fans, if you're going to the NCAA tournament next week in Detroit, stop by our happy hour. It's taking place on Thursday in between session one and two at Hockey Town Cafe. It's a sports bar near Little Caesars Arena, walking distance, I'm told, to Little Caesars Arena. We're co-hosting it with Stalemates, the very popular YouTube show. We're going to have an open tab. We'll be giving away merch. 
Stop by and see us next Thursday at the Wrestling Changed My Life Happy Hour, co-hosted with Stalemates.